So first off, Alex, I want to say congratulations on Thank your 206.7 bushel soybean. That's an outstanding uh, record for soybean yield. And you know, I myself, I'm somewhat of a connoisseur. I'm really interested in high yielding corn and soybean. And um, I think what you've done really speaks to the power of agronomic management. You know, you have access to the same varieties as everybody else. Um, there's a lot of growers in your area that have dealt with similar environment as you this year. Uh, but what you did differently was through agronomic management, you drove uh, the yield, you know, you, you really got the most out of the yield potential of that variety. And uh, I think a lot of that really falls into uh, adequate nutrition. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. So, you know, we, we were talking about, you know, the where does yield come from, the components of yield. You know, it, what, what we really tend to focus on, uh, you know, most guys, and this is the easier component, is, is pod number or seed number. You know, we're always about planting earlier, planting a longer maturity uh, variety, you know, trying to maximize that growing season so that way we can drive a higher node number on the plant, more points of attachment for pods. And you've done that, you've dr you drove pod number and you focused on some nutritionals that mitigate stress during bloom to retain blooms, retain pods. But what you've done differently is, you know, when we tend to drive pod number, seed number, there's an inverse relationship with seed weight. You know, if I have more pods, more seeds, I have less resources to move into those seeds. But you almost did the exact opposite of that. Of, of that. You had a high pod number and a very high seed weight. You know, I did some back calculation. That, you know, on average, we get about 3,000 soybean seeds per pound. Uh, what you achieved was 1,650 seeds per pound, almost double the seed weight of an average of an average yield. And uh, and a lot of that comes, you know, by looking beyond that R3 growth stage. You know, we don't Absolutely. think about managing the soybean plant past that. So, can you speak a little bit about? You know, you know, what did you do, you know, day to day, week to week to really focus in on that seed weight factor? Yeah, um, like I was saying earlier, we tissue sample once a week from V1 all the way up until I'm desiccating those beans for harvest. Every, every seven days we're pulling that tissue sample. And what we're doing there, we're building a trend line. And I want to see that trend line, if it's going where we want it to, if it's staying where we need it, or if it's going down. If it's going down, Two weeks in a row, we're thinking about making an application of, mm -hmm. of whatever that may be, boron, you know, manganese, iron, whatever it is. Yeah. Um, and two, a lot of people, yes, a lot of people don't even fertilize soybeans. The ones that do, they're putting out a pre-plant fertilizer and calling it good. But soybean plant takes up about 67% of its nutrients after R1. Yeah. So it doesn't make sense, in my opinion, to fertilize. I mean, you definitely need a base fertilizer out, but don't stop anyone that's fertilizing they're putting it out pre-plant they're not really doing anything past r1 they may spray a you know a fungicide and an insecticide and call it good around r2 but r1 is when we really amped up our foliar feed and and our our wide drop our injection mm -hmm. everything i mean so when most were giving up on at a the stage they're giving up on a soybean that's when we were just really amping up our fertility program yeah. and foliar fed program too yeah and I, you know i when we when we compare soybean to corn, you know, we think of corn that critical stage being right around flowering, that tassel stage, yep. that critical stage in soybean, that's you know R three, R four, that's when nutrient demand, water demand is it is. It's also its peak. When seed size is you know, that's when you can really enhance it if it's going up or down. Yeah, absolutely. You know, you're you're talking about using foliar nutrition and, and, and you know, one element that comes to mind that can both impact seed number, pod number, and seed weight would be boron. And and you were using Brant Smart KB. Yep, we used uh, Smart B and Smart BMO through vegetative stage mm -hmm. and at planting. And then starting at R1, we swapped to the KB for the potassium acetate and the boron. Mm -hmm. And we used that heavily. That was a, a huge factor in the seed size, yeah. without a doubt in my mind. Yeah, yeah, you know, when, we, when we're looking at, you know, foliar potassium, foliar boron, um, you know, the amount of potassium we're putting on uh, through that product really isn't a drop in the bucket of the total potassium requirement of the crop. But what it's helping it do is, is overcome transient deficiencies during periods of peak uptake. And, uh, you know, we just can't pull that KN through the roots quick enough. It's bridging a gap. Exactly, yeah. And potassium and boron both, they help facilitate the movement of sugars in the plant. You know, you're, you're talking there in Georgia, you got this longer growing season you're harvesting sunlight over a longer period than, than in most areas. But, but you know, once that, that, you know, once we've created those sugars through photosynthesis, those photo assimilants need to move into to your, to your sink tissues, which are those developing pods and potassium and boron both help the movement of sugars in the plant. And when we were spraying at Smart B, Smart B Mo, Smart KB, 
we were actually adding sugar in with those okay. as well. Yeah, yeah. You know, let's go back a little bit earlier in that season. Um, you know, you're talking about making herbicide applications, trying to mitigate stress. What are things that we can do to help improve pod number, pod retention? And there's some elements that we can really look at through Smart Trio. Uh, you know, zinc helps with, with uh, flower retention. Boron is really important for reproductive growth. We see higher pod numbers when we're using boron. And then manganese is another element that helps metabolize foreign compounds like herbicides when we're making those applications. Yep, absolutely. And you mentioned the Smart Trio. That's one of the main main products that I use during my herbicide application period. I spray two post post applied herbicides, and we're putting Smart Trio and Smart Bemo in with those to help mitigate that stress. Yeah. Whether it's right before or right after, you know, uh, it's farming. I mean, timing's it's it's hard sometimes to, <laughs> to do it exactly how you want, but ideally we do it right before our herbicide pass. And it helps mitigate that stress and break all that down a yeah. lot, a lot better on the plant. Yeah. So to me, it kind of sounds like if, if you're going to, you know, get into this this uh, this realm of using foliar nutrition and soybean for, for higher yields, I think there's really two periods to really focus on. And that's that, that vegetative stage that maybe you've started R1, R2, trying to mitigate stresses at that point. Yep. And then things that you can do later in the season to help move nutrition into those developing pods. Yep. And to make, the, that's where your, your bigger seed size comes to. And then early on as well, because I mean, that helps when we're stacking those nodes on, that's when we're determining how many clusters we're putting on uh, of those soybeans. So, mm -hmm. I mean, we don't want to be lacking for anything at right. that point. Yeah. So, and, you know, in my area, and I can't really speak for anywhere else, I'd be, assume it would be about the same. I'm adding two nodes every, uh, I'm adding a node every five days. Mm -hmm. And these foliars are lasting, seven, in my opinion, seven to 10 days. So if I'm over 10 days without an application, there's a node there that's, you know, it could be lacking for something. Yeah. I don't want to stretch on, on high yield bean environment. I don't want to stretch past 10 days, yeah. preferably seven days. Well, I saw some pictures of those pod clusters you had, especially up at those upper nodes. Yep. And, uh, and you know, I, I fully believe that, that that soybean crop never had a bad day. You yeah. know, it never wanted for nothing. It didn't uh, have a bad day fertility wise. Exactly. It had a couple yep. hammering rains on yep. it. But other than that, it, yep. was, it was a good growing season. And like I said, we didn't, we didn't let it want for anything. Food yeah, you know the the environment, most of the environments out of our control, yep. uh, but that fertility aspect that it, that can be in the grower's control. Absolutely, yep. and it's something that does need to be controlled. Yep.